Hello and welcome back to the channel. In today's episode, we're going to be taking a look at your research section and picking out some useful tips and help to support you with that process and beginnings of your research. Let's get started. Okay, so as you can see here, we have a list down the left hand side. Looking at this, these are some of the areas in which I would suggest you start to delve into a little bit more depth. So it might be that you look at the material choices. What kind of materials are you going to be using for your product? You have access, of course, to everything. So just because you're doing a timbers course doesn't mean you're allowed to use metals. Uh, we know this from previous videos, but just to remind you, if you're a paper and boards student, you could also use uh, metals, plastics, timbers, etc. Uh, you might even want to include things like fabric. And if you're a textile specialist, don't be afraid of including some electronics in there as well. But at this stage, you might want to be researching, okay, well, I want to look at my product in oak. Uh, I'll have a look at it in a pine to see the differences between the hard and the softwood. You might then want to go, okay, well, the, the oak's a bit expensive. Maybe I'll look at the pine with an oak finish. And you want to go and research that information. What do those things look like? How much do they cost? So material choices, what materials am I going to use or could I use to build my product? Next down the list, we've got aesthetics. How's it going to look? What kind of color am I going to use? Can I apply color to these? If I'm making it out of stainless steel, can I stain stainless steel? Can I change the color of that? These are questions we're going to need to answer. How would I do that? If I definitely want my product to be blue, and I know that from my research that blue is the color for this product, then I need to know, can I stain metal blue? Can I have wood turned blue? How am I going to apply blue to a plastic, etc., etc.? Also, with aesthetics, we've got the shape. So we've got processes there. So you're going to need to look at processes. How can I bend material? How can I bend wood? How can I make and shape different types of metals? If I'm using foam board, how would I cut and shape foam board to, to be cylindrical? Is that a process? Is there something I could learn there? So sometimes it's the questions you need to ask yourself that form the bedrock of your research. A favorite of mine, biomimicry. It's very important to look at this because often if you'll get, especially if you get stuck, often if you get stuck in a rut and you can't think of an idea, if you go out and look at nature, uh, what's around you, what already exists in an urban environment, what exists in the, in the countryside, what kind of shapes and patterns can I see? So take, for example, if you thought, uh, if you think about Toy Story in the bedroom of the boy, he's got a wallpaper full of blue skies with white fluffy clouds. And that's been created in a repeat pattern. So textile students will recognize that as a repeat pattern, but it's biomimicry. It's been inspired by nature. Equally, like I've talked about before, the spiral staircase has been inspired by nature as well. All I have to do for a spiral staircase, if we're looking down, is add a little head there and a couple of eyes and all of a sudden I have a snail. So think about nature. How's that going to inspire your design decisions? Especially if you're looking at something that revolves around the environment. Biomimicry is something I would definitely look into. Next we've got sizes. How big is this going to be? If you're making a product, let's say for example you're going to make a new controller for a, a PlayStation or an Xbox, you're going to need to recognize how big something's going to be. You're not going to want to be playing a pad like this. It's going to be too big, it's not going to go anywhere, it's not going to fit anywhere. Equally, I don't want something too small that I can't actually work my hands around. So I need to know, first of all, how big my hands are, how big the average hands are, that's anthropometric data. And secondly, I'm going to need to know how big the control needs to be. So I need to know sizes. So sizes are massively important for the product. It could be anything, but how big or how small it's going to be. Has it got to go through a door? Has it got to fit in a drawer? All these different things are going to be part of how big or how small something's going to be. So look at the sizes of the environment that your product's going to live in and how big the actual product's going to be. Next on the list, we have laws. What already exists? Um, are there rules about certain materials? Can we use them? Can we not use them? Are there certain colors that are going to be offensive that we want to avoid? 
So take, for example, China is a brilliant example here. The Chinese find that red is a massively important colour to them because for a lot of Chinese people, when they get paid, they get paid in a red envelope. So they associate red with something very positive. Whereas in Western culture, red can often be seen as a negative in terms of the fact that it's the colour of human blood. So these kind of laws and rules need to be considered for your product as well. You certainly want to be adding things like offensive content to your work. So look at what already exists. Next, technology. We've got things like uh, finger scanners and LCD screens and touch technology now. Might not be terribly appropriate for your product, but it might be worth something to consider for your design ideas. Maybe there could be a part that has that in the future. Or maybe it's something you look at regarding smart materials. These could quite often be readily available in a school workshop and can enhance a design idea. Things like shape memory alloy or polymorph, even some of the heat temperature sensing uh, photochromatic inks and things like that could be part of your process for investigation. Okay, have a look at some of those materials and some of those technologies and see what links to your product. Lastly, we have the packaging. All products have to be shipped from one location to another. It might be down the street, it might be to a different country. How your product gets to that country safely is to do with the packaging. Equally, it might end up going into a shop, so how are you going to sell it? Are you going to have a special type of text on there? Are you going to have logos? What already exists in the market? I'm going to touch on that in a moment. So, there's some subheadings to kick you off as part of your research. Investigate some of those areas and I'm sure you'll come up with a wealth of ideas. Now, interestingly, if you have a look at our bubble at the top of our page here, I've got something called the user. Now that is massively important. As a designer myself, when I'm designing a product for a client, the client, i.e. the user, whatever they need or whatever they want from that product, it's my job as the designer to satisfy that need. So, I need to know some things first. I need to know, first of all, how old is my client? When I refer to the client, I'm also talking about the user. So if I'm switched between the two, I'm talking about the user. So don't get that mistake. And you could call it the client, you could call it the user. It doesn't really matter. So for example here, if I've got a user who's aged 13 to maybe uh, 17, I know that I'm going to have to look at trends. What are they into? What's current on the market? Are there certain colours they're into? Are there certain music tastes that I need to consider? Maybe that's going to inform part of my design process. And that's going to be vastly different than if I change that and that all of a sudden becomes something like this, 50 to 60, all of a sudden the colours are going to change, the style's going to change, and probably the materials to some degree are going to change. And that's due to fashion. But all this comes from the fact that the age of my user or my client has an impact. So let's find out, first of all, how old are your users? Secondly, quite importantly here, what's their occupation? Are they students? Do they need to learn something? How are you going to get your product to help educate them? If they're not and they're a business person, how are you going to make it simple and easy for them to use and operate? Are you going to supply them with some form of instruction? Is it going to be self-explanatory? That's all the questions that are going to be answered from finding out what they do. Equally, we can think about considerations for, let's say they're working in the armed forces. Do they need to be protected from something? Then all of a sudden the material choices are going to make a massive impact. So let's find out first of all how old they are and what they do. Next, naturally of course, comes their views. What are their interests? What kind of colours do they really like? What do they dislike? Take, for example, football clubs. You certainly wouldn't have a Manchester United club featuring the colour blue now, would you? So taking in the views of your users are massively important. So you can ask them, what do you currently think of this product? What's already on the market? 
What do you like about that? What do you dislike about it? So find out what do they like and what do they dislike? Now, I'm not talking about their preference on chocolate bar or Coronation Street versus EastEnders. I'm talking specifics. I'm talking about the products that you want to create. So if you're making a controller for an Xbox and you're going to design it for a series of students and you can say, right guys, what do you like? And they'll say, well, we really like the type of controller where you've got uh, flappy paddles on the back to make uh, quick uh, changes and button decisions. Then I'm gonna put that down. They like the fact we've got flappy paddles on the back. That's something I'm going to include in my design ideas. Lastly, we need to look at the requirements and the needs. So what do they require for that product to be successful? Does it need to have lights on it? Does it need to be able to hinge or open or close? Does it have to be a certain height? Does it have to be a certain size or a certain weight? These are things that are called the requirements of the product and they're massively important. So ask them. Also the needs of the product. Does it need to be used for a prolonged period of time? Do I need to be really comfortable? Do I need to make a grip that I can hold it with? Does it need to be stored away? Does it need to collapse possibly? These are all considerations that we need to think about. If I was maybe a fold out table, for example, so you can think that, okay, well, I've got a long, big table, but it needs to fit in a small space. So how am I going to get it to do that? What clever ways can I make it fold and, and twist and rotate and maybe get some kind of mechanics in there as well? Mm, lovely, right. Uh, next part, this is another section of your research that I'd like you to consider. Oh, briefly before this, the user. There are a few ways in which you can go about this. One is a list. Two, you could ask questions. You could send emails to companies. You could write letters to companies. These are all options that are viable for you. Now, I'm not gonna tell you which one's the best. It's your, decide, your, your design, your decision. It's entirely up to you. But you could just list these ideas. You could then uh, ask the questions get some answers, get some feedback, maybe put them in a chart, etc. Right, now I'm going to move on quite quickly because I want this video under 15 minutes and we're already at 12 and a half. Okay, existing products. If you have access to a product that already exists, get it into your academy, take it apart, photograph it. How does it work? What components does it have? Does it have LEDs? Does it have screws, bolts? How is it connected together? How do you use the product? Pick it up, put it down stretch it, pull it apart. What kind of things works with this product? What's the downside? If I drop it, is it gonna smash? How can I make sure I don't drop it? Is there something to do with the handle? Is there something to do with how it moves, how it operates, how it lights? Have a look at how it's used. Next, how's it held together? The fixings, especially important for timbers, textiles, and metals. Are we gonna weld this? Are we going to solder it? Are we going to use an applique? Or could we use a straight stitch over a cross stitch? Would we use finger joints instead of dovetail joints? These are all things we need to investigate. And then that's when you get into the workshop and start trying these out. How would it be fixed together? Well, this is currently fixed together with bolts and screws. That's terribly expensive, so I'm gonna try and do one out of wood joint, for example. Lastly, what materials have they used? Chances are that if there's an existing product that works quite well, in the sense uh, kettles, most of them are made out of plastic. Reason for that being, it's probably the best material to make them out of. You certainly wouldn't make a kettle out of chocolate now, would you? It tastes nice, but it probably wouldn't do its job very well. Right. So, there's my advice for the research. Have a look at those choices down the side. If you need to, don't forget, pause me, rewind me, do what you need to in this video to get that information. Next, look at your user, identify who they are, what their wants are, their requirements, etc. If you get opportunity, Get a product that already exists, take it apart. If you don't have that luxury, we can always use the power of the internet to go and do some research online and find out what all the products are there and, and visually take screenshots of those and cut and paste them onto your page. Okay, last thing, uh, top tips from me, Mr. Davey, on what the research pages should look like. So if I zoom in here so you can see this, Certainly from my point of view at our academy, I like to see a busy page of research. I like to see maybe two or three pages instead of five or six. And I like to see them uh, blended with different parts. So let's have a look at some maybe anthropometric data, some sizes and scales, maybe talk a little bit about smart material. 
and then explain what you found out here. Maybe do some drawings at the bottom and then annotate and paragraph what did you find out from that? How is this going to help? How does this process work? You could then explain what this page is going to be talking to you about. So this page is going to be looking at blah, 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 blah. And you might want to then go and do some research and get some feedback from the users. Put that into a chart, a pie chart, a bar chart, and, and track that data. And you can use that to inform your next part of your research. You could do this in the form of pie charts, or you could have a look at maybe tables and log some of the information in tables. All this can be done from home with pencil, uh, pencil, uh, pencil, pencil, a pencil, a ruler, uh, and a compass if you have the access to one. And lastly, conclusion. What did you find out from this page? I've put highlighted mine in a blue box because I want to make sure that you guys can see that that is the most important part of the page, and it should be for you too. What did you find out? From this page, I found out blah, 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 blah. It might be that you need to do some further research. It might be that you've identified a couple of specification points. The sizes will be this big. The colors are going to be this because I found out that so many people wanted to have this color. These are all options that you've got for your research. Let's head back to home and finish this video off. Okay, so what have we found out from this video? We've identified a list of research possibilities to go into, biomimicry, sizes, materials, etc. We've looked at the user and how that's going to be important to help start creating your design brief. Identifying the user is going to help you massively here by telling you what they're going to want and what they're going to need. We also touched on existing products. Can you access some existing products from home? If not, can you use the internet and see what already exists that's similar to what you might be creating? Analyze it, find out how it works. Formulate it all into a nice busy design page with some data, a bit of charts, some doodles, and some analysis of your ideas. Finally, finish it up with a nice conclusion and highlight it so that we can see it all the way back here at our academies. If at all any part of this video you've misunderstood or you're not quite sure, then hit me in the comments below and we'll go from there. If you've jumped ahead and you've missed out on the mind mapping section, you can click up here on this little button over here so that you can go back and have a look through our mind map. And of course, so you don't forget any of our videos in the future, you can click on, I think it's about here somewhere, it's like this, this floating face of me. If you click on me, then you'll be going towards that subscribe button so that you don't miss another video. Until next time, stay safe. And don't forget to subscribe. Bye now.